Well, I want to thank you all for praying for me, those of you who did while I was gone and visiting my daughter in San Diego. It was a, a good time. It really was, even if I don't like flying. I really don't. I, I don't do well on planes. Coming back, I was I'm doing better, but I was right next to a, a little infant baby, right in front of me, a little infant baby, behind me, a chronic coffer, and, uh, you know, it was okay. I'm lying. I was just really having a hard time, but you know how it is? Constant. It was like three-hour flight, and this kid's coughing and coughing and coughing and coughing, and finally I just turned around and said, would you shut up? I didn't say that. But I asked his mother, I said, could I give him a throat lozenge? Her? And she says, I've already given him five, and so it didn't, didn't work out. Then the lady next to me, she pumps me, and she says, hey, sir, do you mind if I breastfeed my child? And like a fool, I said, well, do you need some help? I didn't know, what, I, I was just, I didn't know what to, that was really bad. You know how you don't know what to say, and you say the wrong thing sometimes, and I said the wrong thing. But anyway, we made it, made it through. <laughs> you know, I was really, I was reminded, um, when I was flying, I was reminded of a true story with, with Billy Graham when he was, he, he talks about this in one of his autobiographies, and he talks about when he first started his ministry, he never flew first class. He just was a humble man. He just didn't do that. He flew with everybody else, coach, you know, and, and he's in this one plane, and there was this one guy, evidently, that was doing a lot of nipping, drinking, and he started getting louder and louder and louder and louder on the plane, and finally one of the stewardesses, stewardesses went over to him and said, sir, you need, to, you need to quiet down. Try to settle him down. And he said, yeah, yeah, you know, that's sure. And it got louder, and she says, Mr., you know what, Mr. Billy, Reverend Billy Graham's on this plane. <laughs> and so, you know, just kind of, and he got real excited. He jumped up. He said, where's he at? You know, and, and, and she says, well, he's right up over there now. Just be quiet. And he walks over to Billy Graham, and he says, Mr. Graham. He says, I want to shake your hand and I want to thank you. Your sermons have changed my life. <laughs> and, and Billy said he wished there would have been a button. He could have just got out of that plane. You know, he was just so embarrassed. But your sermons have changed my life. Yeah. Well, that's the way it is sometimes. Well, this morning we're in Ephesians 6. We're at the last Stage the last phase of our study, our year study through the book of Ephesians, and and uh, I hope you've I hope you've learned from this. I know I'm preaching so much of this to the choir, meaning that you are all biblical scholars. <laughs> You're Mennonites, whatever that means. No, I, you know uh, Mennonites. And, but you know, here's the deal with the Word of God. You know this. We never arrive, do we? You can read this book over and over, and I hope you do. And, 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 and the Spirit of God just continues to teach you and illuminate your mind and heart to the truth. And, and in the application, you learn how to apply more and more to your life as you grow in Christ. That's the, one of the beauties of our faith, isn't it? Is that this book isn't just an ordinary book. This is the eternal Word of God. And, and it's always new and it's always fresh if you have a mind and heart to see it that way. Well, this morning is the last stage, the armor of God. Now, there have been many titles given to this section, like, you know, the spiritual warfare section. People talk about that. Books have been written on it. The Christian soldier or the Christian in complete armor. Great titles. Um, but, but Paul, the way he lays out this book uh, is just absolutely marvelous. It's a masterpiece. It really is. I mean, the Spirit of God has inspired it, so it should be, right? But, but the, way he, the way it's written, you know, like, remember the first three chapters of the book? He's talking about this issue of, he's trying to teach doctrine and, and, and theology. And, and then he, he makes kind of a shift in chapter four, and he gets into more of the practicality of this doctrine, how this works in our life. And he's dealt with issues 
you know, like uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the church, the mystery of the church, Jew and Gentile becoming one. Remember that? He's dealt with the issue of unity, with the diversity of gifts that God provides for his people. He's talked about the issue of the purpose of the church being to equip the saints for the works of ministry. And he's talked about the issue of this necessity that every Christian has to, to continue to renew our minds daily in Christ, in the Word of God. And, and he's gone over this stuff. He's talked about marriage and family. Wives submitting to husband, husbands loving to wives. He's, he's talked about uh, children and parents and, and he's talked about the workplace, slaves and masters and now he gets to verse 10 of chapter 6 and he says finally and some of you are going finally <laughs> he, what he's doing now is he's, he's basically saying I'm going to conclude this I'm going I'm to conclude everything I've written I'm going to sum everything up finally and I, I would summarize this portion of the Word of God like this, finally, you better be ready because it's going to be a fight. It's going to be, it's going to be a war. Now, let me read these verses. And I'm going to just look at the first couple of verses in chapter 6, verses 10 and 11 in this section. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Wow. Be strong in the Lord, he says. Why? Because you can't make it alone. You are, you are no way going to be able to stand against this evil, powerful force, this person called the devil and all his myriads of legions, cohorts that are working, doing his bidding. You're, you're going to, if you're thinking you're going to stand alone in this, you're fooling yourself big time. And so Paul says, you need to do something else. You need to stand in the Lord and in his strength, in his, in his mighty power. Folks, do you realize that you are in a spiritual war? Yes. You see, I say that because most Christians don't. I mean, really? We maybe uh, theoretically would say, yeah, yeah, there's a spiritual warfare going on, yeah, but we don't live like there is. If we really lived like there is a war, we'd be in our knees a lot more. <laughs> because that's where the real battle is done. And we're going to see that in the, at the very end of this section. But I think he sums everything up with this issue of prayer. Folks, there is a, there's a battle going on. Yes, Satan is a defeated foe, praise God. And I said earlier this morning that don't ever get the idea that there's been some kind of a dualistic warfare going on between God and Satan, good and evil. That is false. That is absolutely not true. There is no one like God. There never will be. He is far and above all his creation. He is the creator. Everybody, everyone is subject to him. Amen. And, and Satan is too. But he, and he's a defeated foe. And, and so, really, if you study this, and we're going to get more into this, God is using him to accomplish his purposes. That sounds weird, doesn't it? But it's true. Absolutely true. Satan doesn't have any free reign. It's kind of like this. He's got a rope around his neck. And God, in these last days, has just given him a little bit more slack. But there's coming a day, and it's coming soon, when God's going to pull in that rope. And it's going to be over for him. And for his followers. And for people that reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, that's what's sad. That is what really is horrifying to me. 
Um, that God has provided a way out, and yet people, people reject that. Well, well, the Bible says that Satan is alive today. He's the God of this age, this world, which means God has allowed him to have some kind of control over this world. Isn't it obvious? <laughs> I mean, it, it's really a no-brainer. As you look at around, you read the newspapers, you listen to the news, you know, there's something happening here. There is, there is an evil force at work here. And there has been since the beginning of Genesis 3, the fall. That's when it all started with humanity. It's not when it, start, when it all started in heaven. Because sin came in the world, not through man, but really through Lucifer, who became Satan. And then Satan came and he tempted man, and man fell into the same sin that he fell into. And you know really what the bottom line is? Satan wanted to become like God, greater than God, like God. And you know what we want to? We want to be our own gods. Don't we? Isn't that really what it is? Everybody wants to call their own shots. Everybody wants to rule their own life the way they want to live it, the way they want to do it. You know, that's, it's that old, and some of you won't even know, that, that Frank Sinatra song, remember? Yeah, you got it. I did it my way. Want me to sing it to you? I... You're shaking your head, man. <laughs> Neck twitch. <laughs> Neck twitch, huh? Aren't you looking forward to that day, folks, when Satan, it's over? <laughs> and Christ comes to rule this place. It's, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. But what I want you to see from the get-go here is Paul says, finally, Christian, finally, be strong in the Lord. All these things that we've talked about in Ephesians, dealing with the home and, and life in general, it's going to be a battle. And you need to be strong in the Lord. And if you're not, you're going to fall flat in your face. Some of you already have. And you don't even know it. You see, I call that Americanized Christianity, folks. We're living in a day in America where we're not seeing so much the blatancy of demonic activity as much as we're seeing the subtlety of it. We're not to be unaware of his schemes, Paul says. He's a schemer. He's a deceiver. He's crafty. He's not going to... I don't believe his main mode of attack today in America, especially, is, is, is blatant. You know, demonic possession, although that happens. But I think it's the subtlety where he just kind of moves in and, and gets us kind of to compromise our, the truth of the Word of God. He gets us to kind of tolerate sin a little bit more and more, you know. And it's just this subtle drifting away from God. And before you know it, we're like that frog in the water that's slowly being boiled to death and doesn't even know it. Folks, this is so serious. Uh, you know, I, there's a war going on. But remember again, Satan is a defeated foe. He is, but he's still roaming this earth as a roaring lion. His end has not completely come to fruition yet. I remember hearing the story of a missionary in Africa, and, and he was talking about this, coming back from his from a meeting that he was holding with this one tribe and he came back to his hut, walked in his hut and there was a 16-foot anaconda wrapped around in his, on his bed. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> I'm not a snake guy. Well, so he, he runs to another hut and his buddy had a 22 in there and he comes back and he walks in the back of his hut and he makes a bead on the head of this thing and he shoots three times and, and nails it right in the head. And that thing just went crazy and just started thrashing all around, man. Wiped out his dresser and his bed and all the little stuff that he had and just crushed his hut. And he said, you know, it's kind of like Satan today. 
And God has given him the fatal wound. He shot him in the head. Genesis 3. He will crush your head. Speaking of Messiah, would crush the head of Satan. Where? At the cross. But he's thrashing today, man. And he's destroying homes and families and schools. And he's crashing things down. He, he's, he's, it hasn't come to fruition yet, his final doom. I thought, you know, that, that makes sense. Folks, we're in a war. Old General Dwight Eisenhower once said that war is a terrible thing. He says, but if you're going to get into it, You've got to get into it all the way. Are you in it all the way? What does that mean? <laughs> to be in the war all the way. We're going to talk about that. Because the only way you're going to get in it all the, all the way is if you understand what God has made, made available for each one of us as believers through the armor of God. And it's his armor, not ours. It's his. Question. Do you believe in spiritual warfare this morning? Yes. Does your life show that? Yes. Guilt trip. Oh boy, he's doing it again. How, how's your prayer life? How's your time in the Word with God? See, absolutely essential to being in the fight. <laughs> absolutely. It's, it's, it's the primary focus of the Christian life is to hear from God every day, to walk with God. And that's what Paul has been trying to do up to this point. He's teaching his people, the people in Ephesians, how to walk with God. Number one, it's based on truth. The foundation is truth. And then we live that truth out in our lives in the practicality of the home and relationships on the work field, wherever it is. We live out the Word of God in our lives. And he says, finally, understand this. It's going to be a fight. It's going to be a war. Well, the first thing I want you to see this morning is, that my first point is that our strength, obviously, is, I've said it, is, it's got to be in the Lord. It's got to be in the Lord. You know what Paul does in verse 10? If you've got your Bibles open. He uses, he uses three of the four words he's already used for strength and power. Remember, he's, he, Paul's about words. He likes, when he's talking about the glory and the power and majesty of God, he can't find the words. It's, God is so awesome and his power is so great. Remember what he said way back in chapter 1, verse 19 and 20? He says, what, he says when he said, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. Folks, this is the strength, the power that's available to you. It's there for you as a believer in Jesus Christ. It's for you, for every Christian. Whether that Christian is brand new and young in the Lord, or whether that Christian is old and mature in the Lord. That same strength, that same power. Uh, you know, I remember uh, another missionary story. A friend of mine that's in missions, he, would, he comes back on furlough every year. And one of the things he and his wife do is they go to Christian grade schools, elementary schools. And they, and they share, they, they present their ministry to the kids, and then they hand out their cards to the kids, and they say, kids, would you pray for us every day? And one day I asked them, I said, why don't you go to the kids? Why don't you go to, you know, some of the adult groups, you know, and get them to pray for you? He says, you know why? There's power in the prayers of children. They believe it. They really believe God's going to answer their prayers. And they have this innocence to them, man. They, they are just, Lord, help them. And, and God moves <laughs> when we pray that way in faith. The faith of a little child. Didn't Jesus say it one time? He says, you want to be my kingdom people? <laughs> and he uses the illustration of a little child. He says, you become like that child. 
You become like a child. <laughs> and you go, what is that all about? Folks, every one of the, I, you know, I believe this, and I've said it before, the, the mark is an, a, a man, a woman, who becomes more childlike in their faith in the sense that they are more dependent on God. Amen. We never lose that. We never want to lose that. Well, if you're going to be strong in the Lord, the first thing we need to understand is you've got to be in the Lord. And why do I say that? That's our sword. I say that, folks, because we live in a day where the enemy has duped us. I believe we live in a day where he is moving in such a way, the enemy, the forces of evil, that tries to convince people they're in when they're not. He, you see it, you see it in, in, on the television. You see people preaching a gospel that's this warm, fuzzy, cozy gospel that isn't the truth. And so people come in based on a little prayer that they quoted and they say, I'm in. I'm a Christian now. Based on what? Well, based on that prayer. Wrong. <laughs> Salvation is not based on a prayer. Salvation is based on, number one, the Lord Jesus Christ and what He has done on our behalf. And it's based on, by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Amen. And so when somebody comes to before the Lord and they become aware of the exceedingly sinfulness of their own sin, when they realize at some level that they have broken, they have shattered the precious holy law of God. When they realize that they deserve nothing but hell itself forever. And they come to the Lord Jesus Christ recognizing that He is the only one that can save them. And they come to Him in faith, believing, trusting, Submitting to Him. See, I think those are all synonyms if you look at them closely. Salvation. Salvation comes. Salvation by what? Grace alone? Through faith alone? In Christ alone? But remember, true saving faith is never alone in the sense that there will be evidences in your life that validate the fact that you truly are a child of God. And I think that's what Paul's doing in Ephesians 2.10. 8 and 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith. But then he says in verse 10, for you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Think about that. You have been created as a believer in Christ, you've been, you've been created to be a child of God, to live for the glory of God, to live in such a way that, that reflects the beauty and majesty of Jesus, that shows the world how great and wonderful and beautiful Jesus really is. And that's evidenced through your life of works. Workmanship. That word in the Greek, I love it. Masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece. Huh. It is phenomenal to me. I love it. Uh, Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, once said in his letters to his students, he said, and I quote, he said, We must see that, that we are convicted and condemned with a rope around our neck before we will weep for joy when Christ pardons us, end of quote. I remember sharing the gospel with a young man who came to me and said, man, I, 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 want, I want Jesus. I, I want to be a Christian. I go, man, that's great. Do you know what you're getting into? No, what? Because he'd been told that if he comes to Jesus, all these good things are going to happen to him. 
And don't get me wrong, there are wonderful things that happen, right? Forgiven of your sins, made a child of God, given the Holy Spirit. You know, you've, you've been given an inheritance that's waiting in heaven for you, and the list goes on and on and on. By the way, that's a great study for you to get into. Who you are in Christ and what you have in Christ. What you've received in Christ. But in this life, I said, you know what? You're going to get in some trouble. What? You become a Christian and God's going to call you to live dangerously. Dangerously? Yeah, you know, you're going you're gonna to be doing things that maybe you don't want to do for His glory, like maybe share your faith or say no to this and maybe not go with the flow and be the only one that's not going with the crowd and you're standing alone and oh, these things might have... He says, really? I don't know if I want to sign up for that one. So he didn't become a Christian. He said, you know, the, the cost that you're talking about is just, he didn't say it like, but he, in essence he said, the cost is too high, man. <laughs> People, there is, the, salvation is absolutely free, but it'll cost you everything. It'll cost you your life. And Jesus said it, I didn't. He said, you want life? You lose your life. You lose your life for me, you gain eternal life. <laughs> That's the gospel. And there's a, there's a gospel being permeated today that people are flocking to. because It's a gospel that's me. It's self-oriented. It's what do I get out of the deal. It's not about you. It's about Him. It's about what God receives in your life, the glory that He gets, and He's going to get it for eternity. The, the joy of heaven, folks, the joy of heaven is that we are going to be able to bring glory to God in ways that we never could in this life. Without the hindrance of sin, kind of bogging us down. And we are going to be able to worship Him and love Him and give glory to Him in a way that we never could. And it's going to go on forever. And if that doesn't excite you, you better check to see whether or not you're in Christ. Folks, my greatest fear as a pastor... You know, another thing about heaven, time will be gone. I mean, it won't be relevant. So, we're going to be able to listen to Jesus teach forever, you know. I mean, it's going to be pretty cool. But Matthew 7 is a passage that has always really, really bothered me because of, well, number one, Jesus is saying it, and he's, and he's talking to a group of religious people, you know, which we would consider like church people in our day. And, and, and some of you know the text well. It's, you know, he's talking to the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those, those religious guys, and he says in verse 21, he says, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now think about that. These are religious people because they call the Lord, Lord. He says, not everybody who is religious or says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But watch this. But the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now notice it doesn't say, but only he who prays the prayer. But only he who is baptized. But only he who comes down the aisle and signs the card. No, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And I've thought it through and I've prayed it through and I've studied it through. And I believe it's this. When you live your life, your life will reflect at some level, Christian, a desire to live the will of God out in your life. Not your own personal will. That is, Lord, what would you have me do today? Lord, who would you like me to talk to today? You know, I was, I was flying to, the, uh, I didn't even tell my wife this, but I was flying to uh, San Diego. And you know, how if you, I don't like to talk on a plane. I just like to be quiet and just try to sleep or, you know, whatever. I just don't like, and I just, this guy next to me, you know, we were going through some turbulence, and I could see his hands grip the seat, you know, you know, really... And I said, I said, uh, does this kind of 
frighten you? He looks at me and says, scares the hell out of me. And I thought, oh, you believe in life after death, huh? <laughs> and, 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 you know, I just I wanted to strike up a call. And he, he says, you know, he started talking about religion and, and all these religions in the world and who's really right. And, but it gave me an opportunity to share the gospel with him. But you know what? I didn't want to. Oh, okay. I, I didn't. But I knew God wanted me to. So I said, Lord, I got, are you okay? Have you ever had those situations? You see, you have. Do it more. Do it more. The will of God, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. But then he goes on to say, listen to this. He goes on to say, uh, on that day many will, will say to me, now the thing I don't like about that statement, folks, is that word many. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And I will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You know, if, if, if the Lord gave me and I never could do this, but if he said, Tim, you can cut one verse out of Scripture, you know, just one, one second, just one, it would be this one. Because it frightens me. I don't ever, ever, ever want people to miss heaven. I don't want people who thought they were in that are out, uh, that were deceived based on some kind of formula that they did. You know, here's... John MacArthur says this all the time. He says, salvation is never based on the past, a past experience or a past prayer. Salvation is based on the present in the sense that where are you at with Christ now? I've dealt with people who say, well, I prayed that prayer way, way back when, and I lived for the Lord for a little while, but you know, I'm doing my own thing now. Are they saved? I don't know. But, but maybe not. Because 1 John 3, 9 says, no one who has been born of God will continue to sin. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. Now that's what John says. That's the Word of God. And so I never want to give somebody, oh yeah, you're in, buddy. You know, you might not be living a lot, but you're in. I don't do that. I say, you better check your life out, man. And if it doesn't line up with Scripture... And you need to get on your knees and you need to plead to God. You need to be broken before Him and you need to repent of your sin and you need to get right with Jesus Christ. Folks, that needs to be our message. And then people come to me and say, you're not going to grow a church that way. I say, you know what? God will do what He wants to do. You know this church growth stuff? Oh, get me going on that. <laughs> I, you know, I love John 6 when the multitudes are following him, right? And, and, and it's like he's walking along and he turns around and he sees these multitudes. And, and there says the disciples. And it's almost like he says, time to downsize. And he starts teaching about drinking his blood and eating his flesh. And it says many at that time turned and left him. They said, hey, this is too much for us. We can't deal with this kind of teaching. We're out of here. And you know what? Jesus didn't run after him. Oh, he was available for them. He, was, he would receive them. And, but he didn't go after them and do this follow-up stuff that we talk so much about. You know who does the follow-up, folk? God does the follow-up. Anyway, I said I wouldn't get into that. And last point. And we'll to be strong in the Lord, you must be in the Lord. To be strong in the Lord, you must know your own weakness. I appreciate Paul this morning for uh, dealing with this in his Sunday school class. He, he mentioned this, this issue of weakness, how God's power is manifested in our weaknesses, which is just totally opposite of the world thinking. Folks, really, this, this understanding our weaknesses is a, is a lifetime process. And it begins at the moment of our salvation, when we recognize how weak we are, how, how lost we are, how helpless and hopeless, uh, uh, how destitute we are without Him. And we come to Him and we recognize, Lord, You're the only one. But throughout our lives as Christians, we recognize more and more that it's in Him that my strength comes from.
Remember the, the, the example that Jesus gave of the, of the vine and the branches? And he used that, that analogy to show us that the vine needs to be plugged into the branch, or the branch into the vine. And without which, we have no strength. We need to be plugged in Christ. He, he said this afterwards. He says, without me, apart from me, you can do nothing. And, and that's understanding that, you know, I am weak. He is strong. Remember that little song we used to sing? Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but... He is strong. And we, and we think that's for children. Folks, it's not just for children. It's for us. We are weak. But, but He is strong. He is strong. Question. Do you depend on Him? Do you depend on Him for everything? Has your prayer life. That, that, that's a truth tell, isn't it? Uh, apart from him, we can do nothing. And I think Jesus, remember, he taught Peter this lesson. Peter comes to him in boasting. Lord, the others may desert you, but I won't. Lord, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hang in there with you. I'll be there with you, Lord. And the Lord says, Peter, listen. Before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And, and Jesus allowed him to go through that horrible denial to show him that he cannot do it on his own. He desperately needed Jesus all the time. Remember the story of Paul. I love this in 2 Corinthians 12.10 where Paul's talking about being taken up to heaven. Something happened in Paul's life where he was just kind of snatched and he was translated into glory for a time. And, and, and you know, he heard things that were he couldn't come back and share because they were so inexpressible. They were so awesome. And, and, and Paul says, and to keep me from becoming proud, boastful. See, I think that was one of Paul's thorns, thorns in the this issue of pride. He was a very intellectual man, very intelligent, and, and he maybe struggled with that. And the Lord, the Lord did something about that. It says that he, he sent a, a tormentor, an evil spirit, to torment him. And whatever it was, there's different takes on what it was, and I'm not going to get into all that. But Paul pleaded with the Lord three times, Lord, I don't like this. Take it away, please, Lord. And the Lord said, no, Paul. I'm not going to take it away because I want you to learn that my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is manifested, is perfected in your weakness. And Paul got it. He got it so much so that he gets excited. He says, man, if that's the case, I'm going to boast all the more, not about my strengths, but about my weaknesses. For when I'm weak, I'm strong. I love that. And that is so contrary to the way we think today. We preach it, but do we live it? And I'm doing this. We're weak without him. And folks, we must know. We've got to know. We've got to know something of the Lord's strength. We've got to know something of his power. Power. And when you study the Word of God and you read the book of Genesis and creation, you see that, well, God is powerful. He is the creator who spoke the worlds into existence. But I think the greatest act of his power, when he brought Jesus back from the dead, don't you think? We're talking, we're talking resurrection power. How much power does it take to bring someone who's dead back to life? A lot of power. And Paul says, remember in that prayer? In Ephesians, he says, that power, that resurrection power is what's yours from God. It is a grace that he has given to you to live out in your life. But it's only manifest in your weaknesses. Think about that. You know, we don't want to be weak. 
confident. You know, America, I'm got it together. I, you know, sure we want to have it together. Sure we want to be confident, but not in self, but in Him, right? In Him, and there's a huge, huge difference. You don't know what I go through every Sunday morning. Actually, Saturday night. My wife does somewhat. I say, Lord, I, you know, I can't do this. Who am I to be opening the Word of God to these people? I know some of you are thinking, oh, how could a pastor think that? He's got to be called. He's got to have that call. You know, I believe I'm called. But I got to tell you, I feel like a spiritual wimp the majority of the time. And it's only when I can honestly get down each Saturday night and call upon the Lord and say, Lord, I can't do this. You've got to do it, Lord. You've got to move in my life. You've got to do something. That's the only way it works. God is great, folks. God is awesome. And what we're going to continue next week is the point where we say, as Paul says, we need to put on the full armor of God so that you can stand firm against the enemy. That's what we're called to. I want you to think about that this week. You're called to stand firm. And I want to suggest to you that there's one piece of the armor that is absolutely essential in that standing firm. And that is the gospel shoes of salvation. Think about that this week. You stand firm in the gospel, in the truth of Jesus Christ. <laughs> there's no firmer foundation, my friends. Let's pray. Father God, you are so great. You are so awesome. You are so good to us. You are so kind. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for providing a way out of the miserable situation that all of humanity is in. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for his life of righteousness. Thank you for his life of absolute perfection that was merited to us. And thank you for his atoning work on the cross. The one who knew no sin became sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God. Thank you for his resurrection. Thank you, Father, that it did not end in death. Thank you for the promise that Jesus gave us that because he lives, we too shall live. And thank you, Father, for his ascension, that he is right now at your right hand interceding for us, praying for us, speaking on our behalf to you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you this morning. The service, we're going to have an ending right now. If there's somebody who wants to pray, we're going to, there's a prayer time over here in the corner. If you want to pray about something or talk about something, just know that we'd love to spend some time with you. God bless you and have a wonderful day.